but these days over near Cambridge. Um, and I'm originally from the southwest of England, down near Plymouth. Um, been licensed ooh, since I was 14. That was in 1994, I think. So uh, you can do the math. Um, but yeah, so reasonably active in the hobby. Um, so the key interests are contesting, particularly on HF. Uh, do a lot of de expeditions, so traveling around um, all sorts of weird and wonderful places uh, to uh, to operate from again mainly on HF. Uh, so recent trips have included uh, Svalbard, Montserrat, and uh, the UK sovereign base area on Cyprus, as uh, NC4. So uh, fair fair bit of travel, um, and um, yeah, and, and also summits on the air is the other activity I do a lot of. So, uh, so climbing up hills and, and just taking portable equipment. And the thing you'll uh, pick out from all of that is I'm basically an HF operator, primarily. Bit of VHF from time to time. We were talking about six meters a moment ago. But, uh, but yeah, primarily HF. So Q100 was something completely new to me. Uh, what else should I tell you about my, myself? I Professionally, um, I work in software. Um, I'm based at the Royal Society of Chemistry here in Cambridge, uh, which is basically an academic publishing and a scientific membership body for, for chemists. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of all about me. Um, so this is going to be a slightly unusual talk, uh, discussing it with Dave uh, earlier well, when we were putting the plans together for this. Um, the pro problem with QO100 is, is it involves big dishes and uh, big bits of equipment and, and uh, boxes of equipment. So uh, the easiest way to do it, I have already put together a video on YouTube. So uh, I'll take you through that. That kind of explains the whole process uh, that I've been through and um, put it all together. And then, as Dave said, we'll, uh, we'll go to a Q&A at the end if you have any questions. Uh, I should caveat all this with the fact I am absolutely not uh, an absolute expert on Q100. Uh, this is very much the beginner's tale, uh, how I got going. Um, largely, uh, I think, uh, talking to, to George about this when we started, uh, largely following uh, George Smart M1 GEO's uh, guides, uh, which I believe you've been following as well uh, in your club. So, um, yeah, getting started. How, how an HF operator sort of approaches Q100, and again, this isn't this isn't the only way of doing it. Um, in fact, this is a way of doing it. That's all. And I took the approach of um, of starting for, with something very simple and basically building the equipment out. So I didn't want to start off by investing a whole load of money in a whole load of equipment and then allow it not, and then have it not working or something. So a lot easier to, to start small. Um, the transmitter receiver I, I'm going to show in a moment is the, uh, the Lime Mini SDR, which I already had anyway for other sort of SDR-based projects. So uh, that's kind of where I started from. Uh, so with that, I shall uh, switch to, uh, to the video. Uh, this is kind of like half an hour. And then, as I say, we'll uh, go to some questions at the end, if that's okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dom, M0BLF, and some of you have been asking me about the equipment that I've been using to experiment with the QO100 satellite recently. So I thought I'd put together a little video to explain what I've been doing. But before we get stuck into the equipment, let's go inside and uh, have a little look at some of the theory behind the satellite. Q100 is an amateur radio satellite launched at the end of 2018 and which has been operational since February 2019. Now, of course, radio amateurs have been building, launching and communicating via satellites for decades. So what's novel about this one? Well, it's in a geosynchronous orbit. All previous amateur radio satellites have been in low Earth orbits, which means they rise and set and you have to track them across the sky. Often they'd only be above the horizon for perhaps 10 minutes or less. Q100, on the other hand, is geostationary, meaning that it appears to be in the same point in the sky all the time because it follows the Earth's rotation. Geosynchronous orbits are really expensive. Slots are limited because there's only a small belt where you can put the satellites, 
and consequently there's high competition for them. All the broadcast and other commercial communication satellites all want to be in a geosynchronous orbit because, well, you wouldn't want to have to have a motorised satellite dish on the side of your house and even then to only get TV pictures for a few minutes every couple of hours, would you? So how has QO100 got one of these precious positions? Well, QO100 is actually a couple of amateur transponders that are carried on a commercial broadcast TV satellite known as SHAL-2. It's a satellite that carries a lot of TV programs to the Middle East, operated by the state of Qatar. And it's Qatar that's allowed amateurs to add a couple of extra transponders to the satellite. And indeed the QO in the name QO100 down stands for Qatari Oscar. You'll remember that all amateur radio satellites are called Oscar, orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio. One of the results of being in a geosynchronous orbit is that the satellite is extremely high above the Earth's surface, giving a massive covering ra coverage range, extending from the tip of Brazil, covering the whole of Africa, Europe and the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and even as far as the west of Thailand. There's even a QO100 station near the coast of Antarctica. Now, all of that coverage is accessible from a relatively simple setup and without the vagaries of HF propagation. By the way, if you're watching this from North America, sorry, you don't get to play with QO100. It's below your horizon. It's Hale 2 and the QO100 transponders are located at a position known as 26 degrees east, which is to say if you were standing at the North Pole, standing on the Greenwich Meridian, the satellite would appear to be 26 degrees east of south. 180 minus 26 is 154, so the satellite would appear to be in, at an azimuth of 154 degrees from the North Pole. If you're in the south of England, near the Greenwich Meridian, it's at an azimuth of about 147 degrees. Now, as I've said a couple of times already, there are actually two amateur transponders carried on QO100. One of them is the narrowband transponder for voice and for no, narrowband digital communications, and the other is the wideband transponder for digital amateur TV signals. The principle of operation is the same for both, but as you'd expect, you need rather more power to use the wideband transponder, which I don't have, so I won't be covering it today. For both the narrow and the wideband transponders, they act similarly to crossband repeaters. The uplink, what you transmit onto the satellite, is at around 13 centimeters, so around 2.4 gigahertz. The downlink, what the satellite transmits back on, is on three centimeters, so around 10.6 gigahertz. Now those bands sound scary to an HF operator by, like myself, but the useful thing is that the 2.4 gigahertz frequency is similar to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so there's loads of common equipment that can be repurposed. And similarly, 10.6 gigahertz is near enough the 11 gigahertz downlink frequency of broadcast satellite TV, so we can repurpose equipment there too. In fact, the main piece of gear you'll need is the 13 centimeter transmitter, but that can be easily and fairly cheaply sorted using an SDR or software defined radio. Make sure you get one that's capable of transmit at 2.4 gigahertz as some only go up to 1.5 gigahertz. And I'll be showing you how I'm using the Lime Mini SDR in just a moment. Unlike amateur repeaters that have a single input and output frequency, the QO100 repeater repeats a whole chunk of spectrum, 500 kilohertz on the narrow band transponder and a whole 8 megahertz on the wideband transponder, which means many QSOs can happen at the same time. On the narrowband transponder, the band plan resembles that of an HF band plan, with CW at the bottom, then data modes, then SSB, and then there's this mix mode and special purpose section at the top of the band. Please note that no transmission should exceed the 2.7 kilohertz bandwidth of a standard SSB signal, so you shouldn't be using AM or FM on the satellite. The low and the high ends of the transponder are marked with a beacon and you obviously shouldn't transmit outside the frequencies contained between these two beacons. The higher beacon may change mode in the future, it's actually an experimental beacon, the low one is CW. In the middle of the SSB band there's another middle beacon which is the PSK beacon. All three beacons have a 5 kHz guard band either side of them so you shouldn't transmit immediately around the beacon frequencies. The PSK beacon is a useful constant carrier source, which we'll use a little later on to stabilise our receive frequency. 
The PSKB can also carry telemetry data about the satellite in the same format as that used by the AO40 satellite, so you can use the AO40 receive program to decode it. And it's advised you do periodically decode the telemetry data because the mailbox may contain important announcements about changes to the band plan or other restrictions in force. You decode the band plan literally by feeding the audio of the PSK beacon to AO40 receive. The only other thing you really need to know about operating on Kiro 100 is that you need to be able to listen to the downlink while transmitting. Fortunately, that's easy with a setup like mine. 13 SEMs and 3 SEMs are far enough apart that you don't need any special filtering. Although hearing yourself with a fractional delay can be a little off-putting at first, the main reason is to ensure you aren't transmitting too much power. Your signal shouldn't ever be stronger than the three beacons. If it is too strong to the satellite, a siren sound will be injected on top of your transmission, so if you hear yourself coming back with a siren on top, you need to stop and turn down the power. Luckily my setup isn't anywhere near strong enough to trigger that siren, but I have heard it on other people's signals a few times. Remember, we're effectively guests on this commercial satellite, and if we don't play nicely, we may not get a similar opportunity in the future. OK, well that's the theory. How do you actually get going on the Kuro 100 satellite? Well, obviously we've got the dish here, but a lot of the magic is actually in this box here. So let's open that up and I'll talk you through what I'm using. OK, so uh, let's uh, talk first of all about how receive works. Um, receive is probably the simplest thing to get started with. You don't even need one of these big 90 centimeter dishes. A uh, 45 centimeter mesh dish is absolutely fine for receiving here in the south of England. So uh, the first thing is um, you need one of these, which is a standard domestic television LNB. Um, the purpose of an LNB is normally to take the satellite's signal. Domestic satellite television tends to be at about uh, 11 gigahertz. And what we want to do is to take that down to uh, about 900 megahertz for domestic television, which is going to be a lot easier to send down coaxial cable. Your losses are not going to be anywhere near as high. Uh, fortunately, the downlink from QO100 to about 10.6 gigahertz is within the range of most of these LNBs, more or less, and we can then just get the signal down to about 730 megahertz. Now I should say that everything I'm showing you here is just one way of doing it. It's absolutely possible, for example, to modify the LNB uh, and get it down to the 70 centimeter amateur radio band instead. Um, but I'm using a Line Mini SDR, which means I've got frequency agility. I can very easily just tune into the 730 megahertz where the LNB is coming out. What I would say is if you're getting one of these, um, make sure you get a PLL LNB. Uh, there are a couple of types out there. Um, for domestic television, it doesn't really matter how frequency stable the, P uh, the LNB is. Uh, the, carry the transponders are very, very wide band, very, very strong. And so frequency stability is not a major issue. When you're tuning into an SSB signal or a CW signal, PSK signal, your frequency stability is much more important. So a PLL LNB is definitely what you want. So uh, normally your LNB would be mounted about here at the focal point of the dish. Um, you'll notice that mine is actually back here. Um, we'll come back to the reason why, but effectively that is just a standard domestic television LNB. And the coax that comes out of it um, is, uh, is bringing me the QO100 signals at about 730 megahertz, as I say. So inside my magic box of tricks, let's uh, follow what happens to that signal. It's coming in on the coax here. And the uh, first thing it hits is going to be this thing here. This is a bias T. And all that's doing is that's uh, supplying the 12 volt supply up to the LNB. The LNB is an active component and needs uh, 12 volts. The RF is just passed straight through the bias T. So that's now going to go into the input into the Lime Mini SDR. Um, you'll notice I've added some heat sinking onto this Lime Mini and there's also a fan back here as well. Uh, and that's because the Lime Mini can get very, very hot if it's working, particularly on a transmit. The receive signal is then uh, just sent down the USB cable. Where's that gone? It's down here, uh, down the USB cable to the software for decoding. Now this is a USB 3 cable, 
um, it gives much higher bandwidth than USB 2. It's what the Line Mini STR uses, but uh, you do need to be aware that the maximum length of cable uh, that's specified in USB 3 is uh, 3 meters. So uh, that's going to limit where you can put your laptop relative to your dish. Um, although obviously there, there are ways around that in terms of, uh, of sending USB over things like IP. That's kind of out of scope for the moment. So uh, that's, uh, that's all there is on the receive side. Let's take a look at the transmit side. And again, the basis of it is again the Line Mini SDR. That's going to be doing our transmission. Coming out of the TX port here into this uh, piece of cable along here. And that then goes into these uh, two, one there and one there, um, little driver boards. These are FP SPF. 5189Z chips, uh, very, very cheap on eBay. And uh, they're specified as nearly up to four gigahertz. So these are just gonna take uh, the 10 milliwatts or so that comes out of the Line Mini SDR and just bump that up to about 150 milliwatts, which is enough to drive our main amplifier. So these are um, require five volts. And the rest of this circuitry basically is a 12 volt circuit. So we've got a voltage regulator, where's it gone? Back here, uh, with a big heat sink on it, which is going to, um, to supply the five volts to those two um, driver boards. Now, uh, one thing I got wrong when I first started uh, playing with this kit is I started off by using an automotive step-down transformer from 12 volts to five volts. Yeah, not, not recommended. The, um, they're, they're not quite good enough for this purpose. And uh, my signal ended up with all sorts of sidebands and uh, nasty effects on it. Uh, and uh, looking at it in, the, in an oscilloscope was uh, quite scary. So uh, definitely want to use a decent voltage regulator for five volts. And uh, thanks to M0WUT for uh, pointing that out to me. So anyway, the signal once it's come out of the uh, the last of these um, of these step down of these uh, driver boards goes into this piece of coax, which then on the lid of the device, just for cooling reasons, uh, goes into the side of this. Now this is marketed on eBay as an eight watt Wi-Fi amplifier. Now two things with that. Uh, first of all. Uh, it's not 8 watts. Uh, we've had it open. Uh, the, uh, the bits inside it, um, maximum it could possibly do is 2 watts. And uh, you wouldn't want to use this uh, on Wi-Fi either. It's uh, not going to be type approved. And uh, particularly in Europe, it's, uh, it's not advisable to use that on Wi-Fi. The other thing to know about these is although they're very cheap, uh, because they're designed for Wi-Fi, they have a very, very, they're designed for a very fast transmit receive changeover cycle, which isn't really suitable for use with SSB and CW. So easiest thing to do is that there's a very simple mod you can do, details in the description below, where you just put a small, small solder bridge between two pins on one of the chips, and uh, that will lock it permanently into transmit which is absolutely fine. You know, SSB and CW, there's not going to be a signal there if we're not transmitting. So uh, we can lock the amp permanently and transmit. Signal then comes out of the amp on this piece of coax. This is going to be your main piece of coax going to your dish. So um, you want to have make it A, as short a run as possible. Uh, we're at 13 sems here and we've only got two watts. So we don't want to be losing very much power. So keep it short and uh, decent quality coax. Well, uh, this stuff, is uh, CRF200, um, which is uh, is a Chinese clone of the LRF200, and uh, and fairly decent stuff. It's uh, still though the 1.25 meters I've got here has a loss of about 0.55 decibels per meter, so I'm still going to be losing probably about half a watt or so of power by the time it gets into the antenna. So talking of the antenna, let's uh, take a quick close-up of this antenna. It's a, it's a potty antenna, as it's known. It's a patch of the year antenna. And uh, let's uh, take a quick closer look at how that works. Okay, so here's the potty antenna, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert by any means on these microwave antennas. But uh, so this is my understanding, is that this piece here is the driven element. The piece behind it, so this piece here, is the reflector and the not quite circular cutout of the metal is what gives us the circular polarization that's needed for the satellite. Uh, this piece by the way is just a lens to help focus 
uh, for the waveguide going back to the receiving LNB. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the red bits are here and also there's a, a red holder that's uh, just uh, holding the waveguide into the LNB holder. Uh, these are 3D printed. Uh, there are designs out on the internet thanks to Rob M0 VFC who uh, put together the 3D prints for me. Now one thing I should say just from a safety perspective is uh, that I wouldn't want to be standing right here when I was transmitting. Now this, as I say, is a 90 centimetre dish and the uh, two watts that's uh, produced at the patch antenna by the time it hits this dish, which has got a, a, a gain of about 26 dBi, uh, we're going to be looking at about 500 or so watts of ERP that's going up into the sky. So uh, fortunately it's got a fairly high angle of takeoff, um, which means that by the time you get to the other side of the road, it's going to be way above the, uh, the tops of houses, but uh, I wouldn't want to be standing right here, as I say. The other thing I should mention is that uh, by the time you're getting up to dishes of this sort of diameter, the larger the dish, the slightly more difficult it is to get it exactly bang on where the satellite is. It is just a pinpoint in the sky. So uh, if you've got a 45 centimetre dish, it's going to be quite easy to find that signal. Uh, it's not quite so, uh, so directional. Uh, these big diameters, uh, certainly if you're getting up to uh, the sort of 1.2 metre di diameter dishes, which you're going to need to do, uh, if you're going to get onto that wide band transponder, then uh, you're going to be needing to have very, very precise uh, alignment of your dish. Now, one very annoying thing to just be aware of with these uh, Wi-Fi amplifiers is that, uh, like most Wi-Fi equipment, they, on one side, use reverse polarity SMA. So this is the normal uh, RF input to it, and that is a normal SMA socket. So that's a, an SMA female. It's got the socket. It's got the thread on the outside uh, ring. Whereas on the other side, the RF outside, uh, is a SMA, uh, a reverse polarity SMA or RP SMA. This is actually the female RP SMA. It's got the plug in the middle, uh, unlike what you'd normally find with a, uh, a female. So this is an RP, a reverse polarity, but it has that screw thread on the outside as well in the female really important to be aware of this um, it completely threw me at one point when i tried to connect together a patch lead one uh, for a female sma into a male sma rp sma and uh, the result was that there was actually no central connector at all okay so i've now come back inside and we're ready to start setting up the uh, lime mini sdr with sdr console so to do that, first thing I'm going to do is to click on Definitions and then search for my Lime SDR. It has been found, that's good, so we'll add it to the list. Now, I could just leave it like that, but if I do that, I'll have to keep track of three frequencies at all times. There'll be the 3 centimeter downlink frequency, there'll be the frequency I need to tune into, which will be after the LNB has down-converted it to about 730 megahertz. And then there's also my 13 centimeters uplink frequency. That's quite a lot of frequencies to keep track of at all times. So it's a lot easier if SDR console can just show you the th 3 centimeters downlink frequency. And that's the only one you need to worry about. And we can do that using this converter selection option. So we'll turn that on. And you see I've already set this up here. Now the TX side, we're going to need an RX and a TX one. The TX side is the easy one. 8.089.5 is the TX frequency. That is the uh, that's the offset between the 13 centimeter uplink frequency and what it then comes back down on on three centimeters. The RX converter is the offset, which is your local oscillator frequency of your LNB. Uh, this can be a little bit variable. It tends to be uh, 9.750.2 or 9.750.0. As you see, mine here is 9.749.9. .9. As I say, it is variable. Uh, the only way you can actually find this out is trial and error. So what you'll need to do is when we come on in a moment to uh, synchronizing to the geostation, to the PSK beacon, um, if you don't see the PSK beacon 
come up in the bottom half of the screen when we do that that will select suggest that your local oscillator frequency here is wrong you'll need to come back and change it so let's uh, save that for now and we'll uh, save that we'll select the lime sdr mini and we need to select a bandwidth which is capable of transmit because we want to be transmitting uh, the lime mini sdr only does 750 kilohertz bandwidth on transmit so we'll go with that so let's uh, click start and hopefully the rig should be found and sdr console will start receiving signals as i say i'm not actually uh, plugged into anything here i'm, I'm inside so uh, we don't actually expect to receive anything a couple of other things we need to do to get SDR console ready to receive on as hail and the first of those is that by default uh, it will only it can only display frequencies up to 9.999 gigahertz and of course we've got a 10.6 gigahertz downlink frequency that we're interested in so we need to add an extra digit that's uh, very easy to do uh, you just go to view and options and then on the spectrum tab just allow a frequency range up to 99.9 .9 gigahertz that will add an extra uh, digit on the next restart next thing to do is we currently don't have a transmit panel uh, so we wouldn't be able to access any of the transmit features uh, we do that just by going to transmit and then to dsp and that's brought up our transmit um, our transmit panel so just to show you around here we've got on the left hand side we've got our receive frequency uh, we've got the uh, the sound card that's being used to receive signals and we can also set the modes and the filters that we are interested in on the transmit side uh, we can we've got the transmit frequency we can optionally choose to synchronize that with our receive frequency you've got a uh, transmit mode and again you can synchronize that so it's the same as your receive mode then you've got the TX button, which is what we'll be actually using to transmit with, and your drive. You'll want to, to turn the drive up, obviously, to get any RF out. Down here is where we'll select the microphone we're going to be transmitting with. Uh, so that's um, got us our transmit panel. Um, the last thing to do is we'll need to synchronize our LNB with the geostationary beacon on the satellite. And to do that, we go to the View tab and to the Select More Options uh, icon. And we're going to need to turn on the geostationary beacon. Now, when I click OK, it'll want to restart the software uh, so that it can add that extra icon to my toolbar to allow me to do that geostationary beacon synchronization. So let's click OK and restart. So the program's now restarted. I've got my geostationary beacon icon here and I've got the additional digit uh, for the gigahertz uh, that's available to me. So it uh, looks like we're all ready to go. Let's uh, go outside and wire it all up. We'll need to uh, connect in, of course, the laptop, a USB headset, and uh, of course we need to put the bo top on the uh, box of, uh, of equipment as well. So now we're going to need to correct any drift in the LNB. And the way we're going to do that is by locking SDR console to the PSK downlink beacon, that beacon in the middle of the SSB spectrum. So I'm going to click on this on the view tab on the geostationary beacon. And what you get here is another little block opening up at the bottom of your screen, which includes, hopefully you'll be able to see fairly obviously, the uh, PSK beacon it's uh, here at about seven four eight nine eight hundred for me if we now press the play icon over here that will now lock everything and you'll see that on the top half of my display all the frequencies have shifted this now means that my frequencies are corrected uh, for the drift of the lnb and as long as nothing drifts too far that will now stay locked so that's about it let's give it a go <laughs> Mike Zero, Bravo Lima, Fox Truck. 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 Mike Z
And so that's Joe 100 in a nutshell. If all of this sounds interesting, but a bit too much investment right now, a great place to start is the British Amateur Television Club's Web SDR. That allows you to listen to the satellite via the web without spending anything. You simply connect to a receiver at the famous Goon Hilly Earth Station in Cornwall in southwest England. There's a link in the description below. And finally, of course, a massive thanks to a whole load of people at AMSAT, particularly AMSAT Germany, and the state of Qatar, who've all made QO100 happen. I've been really enjoying the satellite, and I hope you do too. I'm Dom, M0BLF. Thanks for watching. OK, uh, so, uh, so that was, uh, that was the, uh, the video. Uh, hope uh, hope you all have heard that's okay. Um, so yeah, um, as as I said there, that that's just one way of doing it uh, using using that setup with the Lime Mini SDR uh, uh, to do all the all the grunt work. Uh, you can obviously also use uh, uh, up converters and down converters. You can modify the LNB to uh, to bring the signal down to the seventy centimeter band. Uh, you can GPS lock the LNB so you don't have to do the frequency correction based on the beacon. So there's a whole myriad of different approaches you can take. Uh, this was uh, purely the, the one that I found easiest to get started with based on where I was starting from. So uh, yeah, that's, that's I think pretty much all, all there is to say on that. But yeah, happy to take any questions. Okay, Dom, uh, one of the questions I sort of had when you were going through uh, the setup and everything else there, do you think this kit could be made portable? You know, is it possible for a field day using QO100? How would you even do that? Is there is there a portable kit around that can be used for it? And the the sort of equipment that I've got there is is pretty portable, actually. Um, the, the dish on the tripod is you know, as long as you can carry the 95 centimeter or 80 centimeter dish, 90 centimeter dish, um, that's that's your limiting factor, right? Because the rest of it is actually really very portable. It's that that one box, and uh, you need to get a, a 12 volt supply into it, which you know um, a field day generator should sure. be perfectly adequate. And then a laptop. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone has any other questions, he can wave your hand or, or raise your hand using the Zoom function or unmute yourselves there and feel free. How much, actually, how much are you generally talking, maybe even, Tom, for that? Oh, um, so how much talking? Uh, so the, um, the Lime Mini is probably the most expensive single component. Uh, I think they are currently going at about uh, £250, something in that sort of region. Um, 
then what else have we got? Um, a dish was about thirty pounds. The potty antenna is about uh, forty pounds. The LND you're talking about five pounds. It's a domestic part. Um, I've twenty pounds for the length of coax that I had um, because it's decent coax and with particularly with the RPSMA on the end of it. Um, then uh, the bits, the other bits inside that box are, uh, um, you're talking sort of a few pounds for each individual bit, you know, so it, it really is very, very cheap compared to, you know, a, a decent HF rig, for example. It, it, it's very easy to get going. And, um, you know, as I say, the, the Line Mini SDR, that, that single, single most expensive bit, uh, SDRs by their nature, you have so many different uses for them. You know, you don't, you're not locking up a single thing to only do QO100. You can go and use this same device for multiple other projects as well. And and for that cost, you have instant access to the west of America to the east. Was it eastern Russia as far as that? And uh, to... not 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 America, um, but you can get into into the tip of Brazil. That's as far, so far east, west as it eastern, goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brazil um, and across and to... then across to to India and and the coast of Thailand, which is and you know you're not subject to the propagation on HF. This is this is something that I've really struggled to get my head around. Is the fact that it's actually almost too easy. It just works. <laughs> yeah. If it works at all. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the drivers, uh, Dominic. Yeah. Um, SPF something, but I didn't get the pencil working. Uh, on. Yeah, it's, it's the one George has on his website, which, uh, sorry, let me uh, uh, look that up quickly. I think it's SPF uh, 5190, if I remember rightly, but I will double check. I have check one here. That's, aha, do you? Uh, Yeah. Uh, five one eight nine Z SPF five one eight nine Z, and those are literally three or four pounds. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, uh, don't know if that's focusing uh, in on that's it. That's the one. Yep, that's, there you go. That's George. the one there. Yeah, they it comes pre-mounted on the board with the SMAs at either side of it, and you literally just plug it in and give it five volts. Yep, that's it. Um, we actually, so when I was setting this up, I, I mentioned in that video that I set this up partly with M0WT, who, uh, because of his job, has access to serious microwave test equipment. Um, we did try having three of those driver boards uh, in, a, in series and putting that into the Wi-Fi amp. Um, and that was horrific. Uh, it, you were right starting starting to overdrive the amplifier and um, bit too much input on there sideband suddenly came up all sorts of noise um so actually just slightly underdriving the amp by only putting the two boards in was was much more effective um i probably wouldn't have noticed that without the test gear but yeah yeah i think george says the same thing on his website yeah um and i've seen recommended putting in a 2.4 gig bandpass filter in between two of them Yes, um, I probably should. On the other hand, nobody's nobody's mentioned any <laughs> issues, so well, that's good. Um, th there have been there have been people actually say to me that they are surprised that my signal from the Lime is quite as good as it is because there's lots of dodgy signals from that Lime um, on on the satellite, and uh, it sounds like maybe people are making that mistake I referred to in that video where I used a very cheap step down transformer. Uh, from 12 to 5 volts to power those um, those driver chips, and yeah, if 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 that's if that voltage isn't clean, uh, then the signal just come ends up horrible. Um, uh, Jack GI4 LVC. Hi, Jack. Um, can I ask you about the transmit antennas, which looked in the in the video like two metal discs? Yep. Yep. It, is that a purchased item or is that something you manufacture? Um, it, it can be either. Uh, so this was designed by um, a combination of a, a guy in England and somebody in, in the Netherlands. Uh, they published the design. 
it's an open design. If you've got access to the metal working facilities, you can just download the, the measurements and do it yourself. However, the guy in Holland has now actually gone into business for partly manufacturing these himself. And those are sold through various online retailers. Uh, I actually got mine from a radio shop in France. Um, I don't think there's a UK distributor at the moment, but um, so I, I imported mine from France uh, and it was, I think, 45 euros, something like that. So really pretty good value. It, it saves, saves an awful, there's, there's one thing you have to solder. And that's about it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, Bill, it's Passion Radio in uh, in Paris. That's the one, yeah. And uh, I did the same as you. I bought one, and then I used it as a template to uh, to build this one. Yeah. So this one's a bit rough and ready compared to the bought one, but it's 22 mil copper pipe, and it's one mil brass sheet. I fitted a BNC on it, and soldering was the hard bit. Too much heat in the brass bands. But uh, yeah, an afternoon makes one up. Yeah, it's a really nice, really simple design. And it, there's lots and lots of people using these. They seem to work really well. Uh, and you've obviously got the, the waveguide there, which means you can put the L&D at the end of it. And then you're not, because the, the other way of doing it is to have two dishes, one for transmit, one for receive. That obviously starts to use up garden space. So having that waveguide and being able to put the L&D at the end of it just keeps everything that bit more compact. How much uh, hassle to get the, the lengths, the distances right on the uh, uh, LNB going forward towards the dish? Um, there is, uh, I had no particular hassle with that. The, the only thing I had, I've noticed is that it depends on your dish design a bit whether or not because that um that patch of deer antenna the uh the re reflector if you like is obviously quite quite a large diameter and i found uh, there are some dish designs where it's very difficult to fit that at the focal point of the dish just because it's it's much larger than the standard lnd would be um if you look at the video my, my uh, dish has actually got a, a bent arm for, for that lnd holding which is a slightly unusual design but I got that dish specifically because it does have that ability to hold that extra diameter uh, without, um, because otherwise you're, you're going to have, have your patch of the ear antenna not quite at the focal point, which is obviously going to lose a bit of gain um, by doing that. So, um, but you make, make do with what you can. It doesn't, the LMB just sits on the end of the waveguide. Um, there, there's, no, there's no real measurement there at all. It just sits on. And you mentioned that uh, plastic lens. Yes. Uh, how critical is that? And is that something that you get off the top of a toothpaste tube? <laughs> uh, so that lens actually comes as part of the kit from Passion Radio. Uh, there, are, uh, there are two designs. Uh, there's an original design and there's that one. Apparently the new, that's right, there you go. George is holding it up for us. Uh, the new design apparently is better with the offset dishes. The old design, which is slightly more pointy, uh, is better with a with an uh, other type of dish. It's literally just a piece of plastic, um, and it, it it just fits in uh, fits in at the, the top of the waveguide. Uh, but as I say, it does come as part of the kit if you if you buy the the bought one. Thanks very much, George. You're a fantastic no assistant. <laughs> I know uh, uh, on George's uh, website, he talks about he's, he's using the uh, the cheap Chinese uh, preamplifier, but he also yep. talks about the analog devices. You not have you tried that or? I haven't yet. That's it, probably the next thing. Uh, as I say, I, I I wanted to get started with as little investment as possible, just because I didn't know how it was going to work out, um, whether I'd enjoy it or not. So. I, I, I was trying to keep keep it fairly cheap to start with. Now that I, I do know it works, um, well, uh, I think probably looking at looking at a decent amplifier is the next thing on the list. Um, but yeah, um, that, that then also at that point that starts to open up the the world of the the wideband transponder and and TV at that point. So once you've got a bit more power behind you. And would you recommend everyone giving this a go then, Tom? 
Um, look, uh, amateur radio is a, a, a broad church, right? There's, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do in the hobby. It's, it's just one more facet. Uh, so if, if you think you might be interested in it, um, go for it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not going to be to everyone's taste. As I say, uh, in some senses, it's a bit too easy. Um, also, you know, but, but for me, it was largely the, the challenge of, of moving from HF into this whole world of microwaves and dishes and things I'd never had to deal with before. So it was, it was really interesting, really interesting and um, well, well worth doing, I think. Uh, the box, Dom, that you used, did you use a metal box or just a plastic box? Or just a plastic project just plastic? box. Yeah, um, possibly, arguably, it should be more screened than that. Um, the, the thing I've had to do is really watch watch, um, uh, watch heating on it. The, as I say, you need to keep the, cab the coax length from that box up to the LNB, uh, uh, up to the potty, as short as possible. So I've been running this outside a black plastic box on a sunny day with lots of heat generation components in it. Um, I had awful problems with to start. That's why the the, um, uh, the heat sinks in there. That's why the fans in there because the uh, the line uh, the line mini SDR just really does not like it at all. Um, I actually had it completely shut down on me at one point just because it overheated. So uh, yeah, just need to watch watch heat. So air circulation and temperature and everything else is definitely something to look out for if anyone's setting up any of these. I, I would stations. I would say so, particularly if you're going to have things outside. Um, yeah, uh, if you just go mouse on the box and don't think about air, it will it will not survive very long, as I found. Uh, maybe a Baco foil jacket would be good. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. As I say, I've I've, um, I've responded by by just drilling lots and lots of holes into the box and sticking your fan. In, um, although that does undo the weatherproofing, which is what I'd originally hoped to get from it. I'd hope to be able to leave it outside, which I now can't do, but. Uh, yeah, so the, the, next, the next kind of thing I, I want to do there is, um, is investigate um, USB o over ethernet, um, or over, over Cat5 cable at least, um, because obviously I, I'm not, I've now limited myself. I've got a, a meter and a bit of coax from the box to the, the potty, I'm limited by a three meter USB cable to the laptop. That means my laptop's now got to be within four meters of the dish. Uh, that's that's all I've got. So uh, so by by moving the USB into a, a USB over over Cat5, although that starts to get expensive at that point, but at least I, I could then actually operate the the laptop remotely. And from your the comfort of your own shack. Rather than having to be outside, yes, yes. Anyone else have any other questions? Now's your now's your chance. <laughs> no. Cool. Well, uh, um, my my email address and everything is on qrz.com. If anyone does think of anything afterwards, very happy to to take that up. Definitely. Uh, in the club, uh, as uh, we were saying before we got started, Dom, we had been been working on uh, on a receive side station for quite a while. We've had that up since sort of probably spring last year. Um, very simply set up. Well, one of the club members donated, donated us a dish, but it's uh, it must be 1.2 meters. It's absolutely massive. Fantastic. Um, which getting it uh, pointing directly at the satellite was great fun. Uh, yep. Once we got it, we were getting great signals, but uh, we, we, had, we had lots of problems uh, initially. Um, yeah. And I'm just thinking about the issues you had initially with the power supply on transmit, and we might have some of those on receive with the power supply we were using to drive the LMB. Uh, it wasn't a particularly high quality regulated power supply. It was a wee, wee brick power supply. It could have been something in there. You would get very strange modulation on receive. Okay. Um, I, I gone. Uh, no, I was going to say once we got the the synchronization with the beacon going, things improved, but there was still, it was almost an auroral effect on on receive, which I don't think, uh, yeah, Andrew's there, I don't think we ever got to the, the bottom of it fully. Okay, interesting. Um, don't have any ideas myself. I will 
ask around and see if anyone's got any ideas about I've not heard of the Narul effect. Um, I would be very surprised, mind you, if if a slightly non-linear power supply actually took uh, caused that much trouble for the LNB. Um, th these LNBs are able to basically take anything. You know, they, they will um, they when they're in use for for satellite TV reception, they switch polarity based on the voltage input into them. And they will quite happily get um, anything, take anything from about 11 up to 20 odd volts, because somewhere around the 14, 15 volt point is where it switches from a vertical to horizontal polarization. Okay. Um, so they will basically take anything. Now you mentioned that. What is the polarization uh, that's needed for uplink? And uh, it's it's all circular, okay. uh, which is why the the, the potty yeah. has got the um, got the cutouts on it. It, uh, it certainly develops quite a bit of ERP once you get it onto that dish. Yeah, yeah, it will do, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of people who've, um, uh, who have used the television channels on the satellite for the, the, the commercial TV channels, BBC Arabic and the like, to, to help with the lining of the dish. Um, just because the, if you get a sat, uh, satellite TV receiver onto the end of it, the signal metering and things in that can be quite helpful for for helping get the dish in the right point. Um, to be honest, I did, because I had it available, I, I used a 45 centimeter mesh dish as the initial alignment, because I say that's that's very forgiving. You can basically put it just in the right point. And once I'd established roughly where the satellite was from that, then I swapped over to the 90 centimeter dish um, and did it that way. Uh, Dom, you have your obviously finger on the pulse with regards to this Q100 and, and EAMSAT stuff and everything else. Do you know, is there any other plans for uh, add-ons, piggyback rides on the other commercial satellites that are going to go up to around the other parts of the globe? Or I I haven't heard of anything. I, I, I don't really have my finger on the pulse that much. <laughs> so uh, I don't, I'm definitely not in the inner circle of AMSAT. So I, I probably wouldn't have heard of anything. That said, um, the only what two months ago the um the transponders um on q100 was increased it was basically doubled in size um the 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 bottom beacon up to what's now the mid beacon that mid beacon was referred to as the upper beacon before and they hid the other half of the transponder from everyone they, they left it um, inactive until they knew how much use there was going to be and then on the first anniversary of the satellite uh, um back in february they they said, ah, oh, surprise, surprise, that's exactly the mid beacon, and here's the top beacon. So um, so yeah, they they they've only just doubled it in size. So I don't don't quite know what else they have might have up their sleeve. But very interesting that obviously things have not been used so much that uh, it was a wait, a case of let's wait and see what happens, and uh, everyone has uh, sort of made great use of it. So long may it continue. In, I, I suspect, in, in, in a responsible manner, as you say, people within yeah. the right power limits. That, yeah. Um, because and, we, we, in the amateur community, obviously, we are piggybacking there for yeah. free, and uh, yeah. you know, we want to, to want to ruin that either. No, and they, they do have the ability to turn it off, and um, I, I'm, I'm sure they were just seeing how much malicious use there was to start with before they gave us the whole bandwidth, and fortunately, no, they've, they've done that, so, yeah. The uh, received from G3 BFC, the received signal uh, as you replayed it on the recording, mm -hmm. uh, Dom, um, it was quite noisy. In other words, you wouldn't put that out over Radio 4 for very long, <laughs> or even Cambridge 105. Uh, is there anything that is actually of entertainment quality? Uh, I'm not talking about content, I'm talking about signal to noise. Signal to noise. Um, obviously, you know, the narrowband transponder. Partly your signal strength is determined by dish size. I could get a bigger dish that would increase signal size, right? Um, but we are still using a, a USB, and USB is, you know, is never going to be great quality. If you go onto the wideband transponder, where the um, digital TV amateur stuff is, uh, there they are using the standard DVBS2 um, modulation that standard satellite television uses 
and there you are, basically FM quality at that point. And you've heard that to be FM quality uh, nominally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have, I have watched the reception of a of a digital TV signal, and it is really good quality. I mean, we're we're still much um, lower uh, symbol rates than standard satellite television would have, uh, so it's not absolutely broadcast perfect quality it does the picture does pixelate a bit but the audio is absolutely fine thank you okay uh any other final questions here we'll, we'll give it about another 10 seconds and then we'll begin to close it up if no one has any other burning yeah. desire questions cool no oh. so, okay well, tom uh from the mid ulster amateur radio group thank you very much no problem. Lovely us. to meet you all, and uh, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, great to have someone uh, along, especially over Zoom, and everyone else uh, that's uh, joined us there. Um, thank you very much. More than welcome. Uh, as I say, this is a, a weekly series that the Middles there are uh, are producing, and uh, next week we have uh, John GI four BWM on uh, the DMR. And how it actually works into the server and everything else and repeaters. So, uh, yeah, uh, the link will be on our, our, our Twitter page and our Facebook feeds and everything else. And you can email me directly as well, uh, dcparkinson at icloud.com. It's on QRZ on the 2i0SJV. If you'd like to, be, uh, like to be included in our weekly email drop uh, with the link and everything else. So... Dom, thank you very much. I much Thanks. appreciate it. No problem. See you all soon. Yes, all the best. Yes, yes thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. And uh, yes, if you can include me, Dave, on the email drop, that would be very kind. Thank you. No problem, Terry. I will indeed. Thanks. So good evening, everyone, and nice to meet you. Thanks, folks. All the best. Good night. Thank you. Okay, Take Jack. Care, Jack.